Billina mai kako, mahalo yao ko ike o koko na mai. The series is co-sponsored by HK West Maui Community Fund, the University of Hawaii Maui College, and the Kuei Petition Hui, and co-hosted, co-hosted, by Naikani o Maui Cultural Center of Lahaina and the Hui Aloha Aina o Kamaluru o Lele. Um, lectures occur monthly. The series features a host of new and established scholars, also innovators, and their research work on Hawaii and Hawaiian communities. We proudly present this to you, not via Zoom today. We're live through uh, HK West Maui's Facebook page. Tonight's presentation, Hawaiian Capitalism and Kanaka Maoli Anti-Capitalism, with uh, Dr. Wahikia Ikaleohu Maile, is a Kanaka Maoli scholar, activist, and practitioner from Mauna Wiliwa. He is an assistant professor of indigenous politics in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto, St. George. Dr. Maile is also an affiliate faculty in the Center of Indigenous Studies and Center for Study of the United States. Right on. <laughs> His research interests include history, law, activism on Hawaiian sovereignty, indigenous, criti indigenous critical theory, settler colonialism, political economy, feminist and queer theories, and decolonization. Give a round of applause for tonight's speaker. Aloha nui, wahikia. Maile, aloha. Aloha mai kako. Um, oh. <laughs> Mahalo. Mahalo nui. Oh, so nice. I just finished it today. Oh yeah? I like it a lot. Mahalo. Kiha. Maui. Aloha. Um, Wawao o wahike a maile, um, no mauna wili mai ao makamoko puni o aho a lua i ka moko um, ko lao poko i ke aho ao kai lua. Um, he polo peka wawao i ke kula nui o Toronto, mai takarano mai i ka dish with one spoon. O nao po e o iwi o Nishnabek, hodna shoni, a me here on Wainda, nui ke loha me ka mahalo no nao po e o iwi o ke la aina momona, ke la aina ea. Um, Aya vau maluna o ko lako aina um, o ya hoi. Alaila, um, mahalo nui loa ya o ko uh, no ke kono ia ana um, i lahaina ma maui a kama. Um, eo maui a kama? Eo. Um, mahalo piha ya o ko no ka uh, kui ana i kia ahi ahi um, no ka hoolohe ana mai aku uh, e kuka kuka e, e pili ana o uh, vai vai kolonaia a me ka hoololi ana i ka vai vai kolonaia um, aloha um, mahalo nui for having me um, I, I just have to say especially mahalo to um, those of you um, here at the Naikane o Maui Cultural Center for hosting, um, for being here today, for listening. Um, for those of you also online listening, mahalo um, to the HK West Maui Community Fund for um, sponsoring this event, for bringing me here. Um, I was able to go home to visit with my family uh, last week in, in Oahu on, in Mauna Wili, and so um, appreciate the uh, willingness to invite me and bring me here and also to bring me to Maui Akama. Um, the first day I arrived was Saturday and I um, immediately went to visit the Halle site for William Richards, who I'll talk about today. Um, I immediately went uh, further to Halle Piula. I'll also be talking about Halle Piula today and what William Richards did in 1839-1840 um, at Halle Piula and then to um, Vaine'e to the cemetery at Viola to pay my respects um, to Oli, um, to Honi, to Hui in that space. And so mahalo Maui Nui Akama for um, inviting and bringing me here. With that said, I'm going to get right into my presentation and this lecture. Um, Mo'i David Kalakaua received a unique gift in 1874. A woven mat with an intricate, incredible message overlaid into it. 
Although this kind of mat, known as moina makaloa, is cherished as a prized sleeping mat, traditionally offered as ho'okupu, the significance of this particular moina shouldn't be slept on. It's not simply a treasured object or stunning artifact of material culture. The mat constructs and represents a rich political history about Hawaiian capitalism and Kanaka Maoli anti-capitalism. Drawn from a chapter in my forthcoming book, which I'm hoping to finish this summer, Namakana Ea, Settler Colonial Capitalism and the Gifts of Sovereignty in Hawaii, this talk explains how the mat, this mat, is a makana ea, a gift of sovereignty, offering a profound account of how specific relations of capital opened up colonial conditions of possibility for enclosure, alienation, elimination, and dispossession in Hawaii. Exquisite and erudite, the Muena illustrates that the Hawaiian kingdom's government adopted capitalism as official economic policy in the mid-19th century, and at the same time how some Kanaka Maoli diagnosed and challenged its institutionalization by creatively, as you see here, articulating anti-capitalism and anti-colonial critique, a critique to balance relationships between Kanaka, Ali'i, and Aina. After researching the map for a decade, it's evident to me that this Moina was an exceptional gift one that issued distinctive kuleana to take care of the lahui by taking care of the aina, the land, who feeds. It's a tactile example of the Kanaka Maoli nationalist ideology, aloha aina, which Noilani Gudrika Opua writes, quote, expresses an unswerving dedication to the health of the natural world and a staunch commitment to political autonomy, end quote. Aloha aina, Noi Noi Silva writes, quote, is a complex concept that includes recognizing that we are an integral part of the Aina and the Aina is an integral part of us, end quote. Constructed from swampy sedge cultivated in brackish water bogs at the ecotonal meeting of land and water, the Moina signifies Aloha Aina as more than just a nationalist ideology but also an ecological way of being, to take care of Aina through Aina. What follows tonight is a humble mo'olelo about the development of Hawaiian capitalism in the 19th century and how one makainana, one wahine, crafted a radical response to the formation of settler colonial capitalism in Hawaii. My talk tonight makes three main points. First, American ideas shaped the Hawaiian Kingdom's gradual institutionalization of capitalist modes of production, beginning in the mid-19th century. Two American theorists are credited, although the former more than the latter, for teaching Ali'i about political economy, William Richards and Francis Wayland. An American missionary who became a close advisor, Richards wrote and published a book about the capitalist mode of production to teach Ali'i at their request about political economy. Because Richards knew very little about political economy nor how to educate others on it, the book he authored in 1839, Nokekalai Aina, is actually largely a translation of another text. Francis Wayland's 1837 book, Elements of Political Economy. I actually have a copy of it today that I'll uh, share later on and pass it around so you can see it. An American writer of moral philosophy and political economy, it's Wayland's particular text that Richards taught to steer a modern transformation of the Hawaiian political economy. I agree with Dean Serenilio that, quote, Transitions from indigenous land-based economies to settler capitalism are often naturalized, yet thinking through the tradition or the transitions between such modes of life can be informative, end quote. Yet contemporary studies of U.S. settler capitalism in Hawaii largely ignore and take for granted 
the precise transition from pre-capitalist indigenous economy to capitalist indigenous economy. To more fully understand this historical process of political economic modernization, I show, and I'll show tonight, that American ideas about pre-colonial gift exchange in native communities cast as a primitive and oppressive method of pre-capitalist taxation, what I call savage taxation, blighted economic, political, social, and environmental relations in Hawaiian society. The chapter in my book, which this talk draws on yet won't fully draw out, explains further that anthropological studies about what they called non-market-based gift economies and philosophers writing about the gift reproduced these same ideas about savage taxation in the 20th century and actually transferred them to Oceania and North America. The chapter also explores how Karl Marx criticized and contributed to the development of this thought in 19th century literature on political economy. If political economists like Wayland and Richards perseverated on whether or not Kanaka Maoli could become capitalists, then revolutionary thinkers like Marx questioned instead if native peoples like Kanaka Maoli were the original communists. Second, instead of contending Hawaiian capitalism in the 19th century shielded the islands from colonization, it was capital that exposed Hawaii to colonialism. Indigenous capitalism in sovereign Hawaii was neither neutral nor inevitable. My argument holds a strand of Hawaiian history in productive tension with stout criticisms of settler colonialism and racial capitalism in the wake of recent writing that rejects colonization occurred in the islands to varying degrees while simultaneously celebrating the Hawaiian kingdom's implementation of capitalism. In his study on Hawaiian governance and its modernization, Kamana Beamer posits that Ali'i in the 19th century appropriated Euro-American ideas and statecraft to bolster international diplomacy, to strengthen national sovereignty in culturally appropriate ways. I agree that Ali'i weren't docile, passive leaders, but exerted agency, adopting ideas, institutions, practices that they gleaned from foreign missionaries political economists, jurists, and international diplomats. But building on Kehaulani Kawanui's work, I find that Beamer's theorization of selective appropriation overlooks the coloniality of power. So let me just explain a sec. For Beamer, power gets exercised in treaty, in law, in policy, yet not also in the production of economic conditions and consolidation of ideas, knowledge, and social relations. He thus argues that colonization began in 1893, when an oligarchy, as we know, of white businessmen, lawyers, and politicians overthrew and replaced the Hawaiian Kingdom's government. Kaunusai takes this argument one step further. Sai claims Hawaii has never been colonized but instead is under a belligerent U.S. military occupation. Whereas Beamer affirms the kingdom appropriated capitalism in the late 1840s by establishing what we know now as a hybrid system of private property for collective land rights to shield against external territorial seizures, Kuleana, Sai praises the Hawaiian state's economy as a system of cooperative capitalism which valued civic equality, public education, and social welfare. Sai flippantly writes, quote, Karl Marx would have found the Hawaiian kingdom's political economy very appealing, end quote. My research, however, shows capital was actually institutionalized in the early 1840s through specific relations of money, monetary taxation, and exchange value, which I'll talk about later, and that these specific relations harmed 
the relationships between Ali'i, Makainana, and Aina. This economic transformation, a kind of primitive accumulation considered by Marx to be, quote, anything but idyllic, end quote, fueled a political consolidation of settler colonial capitalism in Hawaii, which is still operative, as you know, and as we know, in ongoing struggles against dispossession, resource extraction, development, and genocide, and for decolonization, deoccupation, and liberation across the Pai Aina. Third, while work in the field of Hawaiian studies on history, literature, politics, and environmental science tends to conceptualize Aloha Aina as either anti-capitalist or anti-colonial, I suggest it was and should be considered both. New writing on Aloha Aina exploded in the last two decades. Generally, this literature conceives Aloha Aina in three specific frames. First, an indigenous practice cultivated in Hawaii for environmental revitalization and sustainability to counter industrial expansion locally and planetary destruction globally. I'm thinking of Candice Fujikane's new book, Mapping uh, Abundance, that was recently published. Second, a nationalist ideology for patriotism and loyalty to the Hawaiian kingdom and its independent state in admonishment of illegal U.S. occupation. And I'm thinking not just of Kamana Beamer and Keanu Sai, but also there are other interlocutors like Umi Kai, um, Donovan Preza. Umi Kai was my high school history teacher at Kamehameha. Shout out, Umi. And third, a practice, discourse, and worldview articulated by Native Hawaiians expressing resistance to colonial forms of power, domination, and control. And so I'm thinking about Noilani Gudra Ko'opua, Keholani Kawanui, um, Ku'uloha Ho'omanawa Nui, um, so many other scholars thinking about that. The demarcation, however, of these three frames, mostly from writing in the first two, is often produced, in my view, through an ahistorical, sometimes apolitical interpretation of capitalism and colonialism as somehow distinct and separable, thus not co-constituting in economic relations and political practices over time, together. Rather than mutually exclusive following newer research by Kawanui and Gudra Ko'opua in particular, the three frames of Aloha Aina with their figures the environmentalist, the nationalist, the native, in my research intersect in mutually inclusive ways, offering insights toward a more radical Kanaka Maoli theory of liberation. On April 27, 1874, Mo'i Kalakawa accepted a Moina Makaloa as a remarkable gift Nupepa reported soon thereafter the mat was a makana, a surprising and wondrous gift. Two days later, on April 29, an article in Kohova Iponoi read, He makana ana hoi komo'i, a new gift for the king. The article explained on Monday morning that week in 1874, George S. Gay, a relative of Elizabeth Sinclair, who purchased Ni'ihau ten years earlier from Lota Kapuaiva, gifted the mat to Kalakaua, the second democratically elected Mo'i. Although most were familiar with Moina Makaloa, Kohova Iponoi claimed this Makaloa mat's magnificence was exceptionally uncommon. Mats produced from Makaloa sedge known in bionomial nomenclature as Cypress livigatus. I've been practicing that for a decade now, and I think I finally got the pronunciation right. These mats and their sedge can be found with plated overlays representing symbols and patterned motifs. These symbols and motifs are referred to as pavehe, and wahine weavers from Ni'ihau are widely recognized for their expert overlaying of makaloa mats in pavehe style, like you see here. For instance, the peva is a commonly found motif in these mats. Appearing like a triangular fishtail, this peva symbol represents patches of typically hard wood, carefully carved, then inserted in wooden bowls 
Mecca to fix cracks and strengthen its structural integrity. On the left, in this slide, is a um, coal bowl that my father turned, and you see the beginning stages of how a crack gets fixed with PEVA. And then on the right-hand side of the slide, you see the finished uh, umeke in his right hand. And this is a picture of my father, Keith Miley. I asked for a picture where he was smiling. <laughs> Many Moena Makaloa stored in Bishop Museum's cultural collections contain brilliantly overlaid motifs, sometimes repeated in close proximity, to signify animals like the Honu in this example. This was a gifted mat with striking, complex patterns. Very dissimilar from the ones I just showed you, too. What makes this Mwena Pa Vehe Makana, named as such in an article published in Kanupe Paku Okoa on May 2nd, 1874, distinctly rare and beautiful, perhaps unrivaled in the Fiber Arts Archive, is that it was overlaid with a text spelling out letter by letter an extensive message in Olala Hawaii. Before I turn to the text and its message, Kohova Iponoi concluded its report discussing the master weaver, Kalaio Kamalino, or Kalai for short, who constructed the mat and its message. Native to Niihau but residing on Kauai at the time, Kalai wove the large, sophisticated moena approximately six feet wide and seven feet tall, with five horizontal panels connected vertically containing 1,253 characters. Sitting at a diagonal angle and read from left to right upwards, the letters spell out a request, and it was completed in less than one year. This alone is an impressive feat considering that Makaloa mats of this size could take five to six years to finish. For Kala'i, Kala'i Okamalino, whose name can mean the calm and the stillness, there was no time to waste. Gay either acquired the mat on Ni'ihau, where his family settled, and Kala'i lived, or Kawa'i, where she moved to later in life. And many residents of Ni'ihau moved from Ni'ihau to Kawa'i because of the, as they say in petitions, the oppressive rule of the Gay Sinclair family who had purchased the island. While passing through Oahu, Gay presented it to Kalakaua just three days before he convened the legislature and uttered the famed statement, Ho'ulu Lahui, increase the people, grow the nation. I often wonder how the gift of Kala'i's mat with its aesthetic splendor and spectacular message might have stirred and moved Kalakaua. What kuleana did it present to the sovereign and his government to Ho'olu Lahui? What was Kala'i's message and how has it been interpreted and normalized as the quote-unquote protest map? What was she protesting then? And what might we learn about it today? Based on my research on the Moena, New Pepa, and Hawaiian Kingdom tax laws and monetary policy in the 19th century, the text woven as a message into the Moena was a careful criticism against Hawaiian Kingdom monetary taxes on animals as harmful taxation policy that drove political, economic, environmental, and social transformation throughout Hawaii. Monetary taxes on animal ownership. But American ethnologists and anthropologists from the Bishop Museum and elsewhere around the world continue to claim Kala'i instead protested a greedy monarchy for its exploitative tax policy and still savage economy. I argue this wasn't the case, though. Instead, Kala'i articulated a nuanced critique of capitalism for how its introduction and reproduction in Hawaiian society generated conditions of possibility for settler colonialism. 
Rather than suggesting colonization of Hawaii fomented or facilitated Hawaiian state capitalism or settler accumulation in the islands, I contend capitalist modes of production, money, monetary taxation, and exchange value introduced by American political economists and missionaries and learned and later made into law by Ali'i in the mid-19th century steered colonial forms of power, enclosure, alienation, elimination, and dispossession. In this way, capital greased the wheels of colonialism in Hawaii. Let me explain this point just a bit more. Hired by Kaui Keoli in 1838 for a $600 fee, I wonder how much that would be worth now, William Richards taught Ali'i about political economy. In the royal residence Halepiula, here in Lahaina, the original capital of Hawaii, Eo Mauyakama? Eo. Eo. Historian Thomas Wood says, quote, the seminar attendees almost certainly included all of the chiefs who became members of the House of Nobles when Kamehameha III signed the first constitution on October 8, 1840, end quote. A Protestant missionary from Massachusetts arriving in 1823 with the second company sent by the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. Richards, pictured here, admittedly was no expert on political economy or how to teach it, but still he was asked and assigned and paid to do so. In an 1834 letter to the mission, he derided the Hawaiian government and its economic policy, quote, the system of government, as you are already aware, is a most effective one, and at the same time, very oppressive. How could it be altered is a great question. I would be unsafe to offer the lands for sale, and yet it would be very desirable that those who cultivate the soil should own it. I think, however, that the greatest evil that exists is in the irregularity or instability of the government. And here's the critical passage. He says, the amount of taxation is such as to be very oppressive. Prior to lecturing Ali'i, Richards offered this rudimentary observation of Hawaiian economics in the letter, and it was disdain for Hawaiian governance and politics. Specifically, though, he considered taxation policy to be the source of oppressive government, a great problem to question and alter, and a superior concern as he puts it, to those about land privatization and land tenure. According to Yuri Mikinen, Richard's letter constructed a missionary theory of Hawaiian despotism, which suggests that Ali'i were despotic tyrants subjecting Hawaiian citizens to unfair economic policy for their own financial benefit. But this theory hinges on a fundamental idea from the writing of American missionaries, political economists, and Missionaries like Richards turned political economists, <laughs> and that is savage taxation. Charging Ali'i as despots, subjugating Makainana for hoarding of personal wealth and individual power, expressed this belief, a belief that pre-capitalist forms like Ho'okupu by the Hawaiian kingdom were oppressive, as in uncivilized because they were primitive, as in pre-modern. I'm gonna pass around the book that William Richards used to write his own, to teach our elite about political economy. Um, the book by Francis Wayland. So I came across it in an archive at the University of Toronto. Um, this book is the third version of Wayland's text. So he wrote the first in 1837, which then Richards translates into No Ke Kalai Aina. He writes a second in the late 1840s, and then he writes this one in the um, 1880s as like a hand guide for school children. Kanae Lee, could you pass this out? So um, I'd love to pass it around so you can see it. This is the text that William Richards 
use to teach our li'i about political economy. Um, so Richards wrote No Ke Kalai Aina as a translation fashioned in three weeks of this text, Francis Whalen's 1837 book, Elements of Political Economy, to frame his lecturing ali'i on capitalist modes of production, exchange, distribution, and consumption. Although recognized that he lectured on capitalism, the exact details of the lectures are largely unknown, which makes analyzing no ke kalai aina all the more important this also means it's critical to study Wayland and his book that you have in your hands, The Elements of Political Economy. But why did Richards turn to Wayland? Any guesses? Richards attended Williams College from 1815 to 1819 and began shortly thereafter working with the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, which was established in 1810 by graduates of Williams College. One of those graduates was Francis Wayland. Translating Wayland, who a liberal Republican philosopher and close follower of Scottish economist Adam Smith, um, he recalled actual explicit illustrations from Adam Smith's book for this text, Elements of Political Economy. Richards actually organized his book exactly like Wayland's. So on this slide, you see the preview pages of Richard's book, No Ke Kalai Aina, where he previews four main sections of his text based on Wayland's. Ho'onuivai vai, production, Ku'ai, exchange, pu'unaue vai vai, distribution, and ho'opau vai vai, consumption. And one of the interesting uh, reasons why I'm translating it this way, not just because Richards is translating Wayland, um, but also if you read the elements of political economy, Wayland talks about this mode of capitalist production, consumption, as the destruction of value. Ho'o pao vai vai, to make pao vai vai. So although the final section was never completed, the structure of no ke kalai aina mimics that of Wayland's in this way, which some known translations have glossed. Interestingly, while most Kanaka scholars agree that vai vai signifies abundance, Richards translated the word capital into vai vai. Certainly, vai vai reflects a system of abundant environmental resources and economic ideas about value, sustainability, and reciprocity. Vai vai, or vai doubled this way, is a reference to the abundance, not scarcity, of fresh water in Hawaii. But the meaning of vai vai has been inflected by other ideologies. In the preceding passage in Richard's book, it became warped by a colonial ideology of capital. In No Ke Kalai Aina's section on Ku'ai, Richards writes, Ikoho oponopono ana ike Ku'ai, he mea nui ko opololei ka au hau, a mea ka uku, a mea na mea apau i pili i ka vai vai o ka aina. Pono e maupopo mua ka vai vai pili i ke ali'i, a mea ka vai vai pili ole. A, ina ike mua na kanaka, Ua kaumaha, a laila, a ole lako e kuai, ina laveia ka vai vai i kahi kuai, a laila ua ike, a ina nui ka uku, a me ka ohi, a laila nui ka huna ana ona kanaka, a me ke kuai malu ana, a lilo no hoi a mea, i mea e hevaloa, o ka pono ona lii, a me ka pono ona kanavai, a me ka pono o ka auhau. Ame ka pono o ka uku, he mau mea nui loa ia i ka ho'oponopono ani ki kuai. In regulating exchange, correctly adjusting taxation is a very important matter, as well as the payment, and all things associated to the wealth of the land. Understand first the wealth belonging to ali'i and those without wealth. 
And if the people see it first, they will become kalmaha, saddened, troubled, sacrificed. Then they won't engage in exchange. If capital for some exchange is taken away, then ua ike, exhibited, shown off. And if tax payment is large as well as the collection, then the people will be reduced to huna, powder or secret. And so too their ku'ai malu, their strength or protection to exchange. And seizing possession in this way is to act incredibly heva, wrong, mismanaged, sinful. Of the duty of ali'i and laws and the fairness of taxes and their payment, these are extremely significant matters for regulating exchange. This is what ali'i were taught by William Richards and to some degree internalized. It's what I call vai vai kolonaya or colonial capitalism. In an 1839 report to the mission, Richards recounted, I endeavored, quote, as much as possible to draw their minds to the defects in the Hawaiian government and practices, and often contrasted them with the government and practices of enlightened nations. I found them uniformly ready to listen to instructions, and they have manifested a becoming wish to reform the government in those particulars where it is inconsistent with true political economy." End quote. In Noke Kalai Aina, Richards translated three illustrations from Wayland's text, which hopefully is still being uh, shared around, to hammer home his point about political economy, government, and enlightenment. First, in Elements of Political Economy, Wayland repeatedly invoked the quote-unquote Indian example. So on one hand, position native peoples of America as unenlightened, quote-unquote, half-naked savages because of their pre-capitalist economies and practices. And on the other hand, suggest they might be civilized and saved by capitalism. Here, Richards taught Ali'i about race, hierarchies of humanity, and colonial racism through the capitalist mode of production as well as the potential, however, for enlightenment by adopting what he called true political economy. Second, and this one is my favorite, regarding Wayland's discussion of industry, Richards describes three types of human strivings. One, to seek the nature of activities. Two, to seek the laws of things on earth. And three, to actually do work. Exemplifying those who combine two such strivings, he writes that Isaac Newton sought the nature of light and its laws to engineer telescopes. In this case, Richards instructed Ali'i to strive for advancing their civilization through the study of natural sciences like astronomy and technological innovations like the telescope. Third, in the very next paragraph, Richards invoked Wayland's quote-unquote Negro example to suggest that African peoples, although skilled in minor industry and quote-unquote physically skilled in running fast, don't understand natural law and therein are more susceptible to malnourishment and death. In the final example, Richards taught Ali'i the uncivilized nature and savage economies of Africans are fatal. Without a knowledge of the laws of nature, Wayland wrote, quote, we should all be savages, end quote. As chapter three and four in my book explain, there is a critical urgency to interrogate how this American thought, these types of pedagogical examples, this vai vai colonial with its anti-Indian racism, glorification of astronomy industry development and anti-blackness can be reproduced by Kanaka to this very day almost 200 years later. In the wake of publishing No Kekalai Aina and Richard's lecturing Ali'i about political economy, the kingdom's first laws were published in 1839 and the first constitution in 1840. Richard's teachings, Sai suggests, quote, laid the foundation for a new political economy and constitutional change, end quote. Scholars of Hawaiian nationalism and state sovereignty concur that Richard's teaching, the teaching that I've 
des been describing, contracted by Ali'i at their request, made a substantial impression on the formation of the kingdom's government, the modernization of the Hawaiian kingdom. Beamer expands on Sai's point, quote, by acquiring risk Richards, they were gaining knowledge of how other countries were governed as part of a larger plan to conduct politics on the international level so that Hawaii would be respected by foreign nations, end quote. We've heard this before. In their analysis, transitioning to a capitalist political economy could modernize the Hawaiian nation as a recognizably advanced civilization and thus autonomous state. Hawaiian capitalism might, in this argument, civilize and propel Hawaiian society into a co-evil status paralleling the advancement and autonomy of enlightened foreign powers, like the ones that we were talking about previously, Spain, Portugal, France. But what undergirds such analysis, argumentation, and desire is this American idea about savage taxation, which I'm going to show next fueled the political, economic, environmental, and social transformation of relationships between Ali'i and Makainana, as well as Kanaka and Aina. Kala'i's mat and message, pictured here again in color, expressed a creative Kanaka Maoli anti-capitalism fashioned as anti-colonial critique within a sovereign Hawaiian nation state. Noilani Arista observes, quote, published law inaugurated unforeseen and unsought for transformations in social relations between Ali'i and Makainana, end quote. Ali'i may have employed an OEV optics, as Kamana Beamer names it, to appropriate capitalism for refining Hawaiian law and state operations, what they believed to be well-intentioned for the betterment of Hawaiian society. But Hawaiians like Kala'i from what I call a makainana optics, analyzed this sovereign exercise of Hawaiian capitalism and in fact dissented against it with fantastic artistic imagination without disdain for indigenous governance or national sovereignty. In my view, a makainana optics opens our interpretation and values how common people the people residing across the islands could perceive their elite with reverence and as active agents yet still express criticism of harms implemented by haule as well as elite. In the beginning of her text, Kala'i celebrates the Hawaiian kingdom's previous government as fair and just, then consequently suggests that taxing animals as chattel or personal property became unfair and unjust. Constructing a genealogy of governance, the message starts with Kamehameha I. No kahanai ana o Kamehameha ina li'i a pau i ka aina, a i kuai, a hupua, a i kalana, a i okana, a i moku, a i moku puni, o yoho i ka Kamehameha o i hana i ka wā i lana kila a i o Kamehameha maluna o kona au puni. Ho onoho aku la o ia ina li'i a pau maluna o ka aina, Kela ano keia ano ona li'i a pauana i ho o noho i ai maluna o ka aina. Kamehameha provided for all the chiefs of the land, thus establishing the ahupua'a, kalana, okana, moku land sections, and islands. That was what Kamehameha did when he stood at the head of his government. He placed the chiefs over the lands, all kinds of chiefs settled on the land. Identifying Kamehameha institutionalized a government seeking to caretake Aina in Hawaii, Kala'i discusses how he transformed law and order in the Lahui. Like ho'i kamalu na li'i a me na makaina na malalo ke kanavai ho kahi. Hele kalu a hine a moi keala, ku kapu ko a hina ilalo, ku kamaita a hina ilalo. Ni nau kamoi a Makaho hua hua lau ina elele, he hala ka ano a kalua hine, ame ka alema kule, he puko, he pu maia, ha i mai la na elele i ka ano o kalua hine ame ke a ka alema kule, o ka kamehameha kumu kana vai no ia, oia no kona maluhia. 
The chiefs and the commoners shared the peace under the one law. Let the age sleep on the highway unharmed. Let the sugar cane grow until it falls over. Let the banana grow until it falls over. The king questioned his messengers to find out what they thought. What are the old women and old men like? Are they like the sugar cane and banana stalks? They told him what they were like. That was his peace. In 1797, Kamehameha established Kanavai Ma Malaho, the law of the splintered paddle, and this is while Kala'i was alive. To balance relations between Ali'i and Makainana, particularly to protect commoners, the people, citizens, from the threat of physical harm by Ali'i. Under this rule and its larger principle, Makainana could grow and flourish like the sugarcane and banana, as Kala'i suggests. These remarks signify Hawaiian governance is premised on cultivating Hawai'i's ecology totally, wherein Aina and Kanaka are connected and inseparable, but also interdependent for both protection and growth. Kala'i continues, Nokomea ho ailona maluhia nuio konaopuni, okalua hine me kailema kule oyano na hua kumu kanavai, aole e hau ia. Kamaluhia nui no ia o ko Hawaii ne pai aina i kava puka mai ai. No loko mai ke aloha i kona lahu i kanaka i puka mai ai. No laila, kawa e la ia i kona kanavai ma malahoa i mea i e luku hou ole aku ai i kona enemi. Peace was the symbol of his government, the old men and old women, the constitution. There was no ruthless seizing. It brought peace to the Hawaiian Islands when it was issued. It was issued because of his love for the people. Therefore, he laid down his mama lahoa law that there be no more destruction of his foes. Kala'i posits that Kamehameha's older government provided not just peace arising from his aloha for the lahui, but also a kind of freedom. <clears throat> no laila, Lana ki la e la kalahui kanaka malalo o ke kana vai ho o kahi iolelo ia. He ma malaho, oia no kamaluhia nui o kona aupuni, ame kahano hano, a hai na hoala no ke aupuni kahiko no kamehameha kahi. The people became free under the one law, ma malaho. It is really the greatest peace and distinction of his government, a rusing declaration from the older government, that of Kamehameha I. Mamalaho is a reminder of Kamehameha's leadership that Kala'i marks might revitalize governance, balance, and relations in Hawaiian society. Nearly 200 years after his death, uh, Noilani Arista says, quote, Kamehameha is remembered as an ali'i pono, just ruler, one who enacted kanavai laws that protected the welfare of the common people, end quote. Kala'i, in this culturally appropriate ethos, as Arista says, distinguishes between his government, which maintains such peace and freedom, from newer governments, blighting relations between Kanaka and Aina. She then issues her request at the end of her message. Yala e kākou i nā kumu nui i emi ai kalahui Hawaii. Ame ka pii ana o ka lāhui mua i ka wā kahiko ya Kamehameha no ka noi ana, noi ana ana makainana i ka moi e ho'o loli i ka auhau, maluna o nā holoholo nā, bipi, leo, hoki, mula, hipa, aole loa e koi ke kahi o ia ano. She says, let us rise as a new generation against the great causes for the decrease of the Hawaiian people and nation and ascend from the former in the older time of Kamehameha to make a request by the common people to the king. Turn over the tax on animals, cattle, horses, asses, mules, and sheep, and let none of these remain. The request here is crucial to consider for the kauna that Kala'i left for us, for us here, to find. Brandy Nalani McDougall says that kauna as a literary device and way of knowing is a practice to both conceal meaning and interpret complex messages with multiple meanings. Here, Kala'i claims that the Lahui diminished in population and as a nation under governments preceding Kamehameha. She then explicitly states that 
animal taxes, instituted in 1843 by Kaui Keoli, mandated to be paid in hard currency money because of this 1841 law, this 1841 law should be turned over. This is, in my opinion, a cautious and clever positioning of monetary tax on animals to be fundamentally shifting the exchange between ali'i and makainana, and therefore a potential cause for the decrease of the Hawaiian people and nation. Makainana had no choice, Carlos Andrade laments. Quote, they were forced to enter the cash economy. Currency would now be the only acceptable form for balancing out responsibilities to society and government. End quote. However, these forces of capital, money, monetary taxation, and exchange value, in my view, are the objects of Kalai's critique. Bringing an anti-capitalist ethos together with an anti-colonial critique. Economic transformation beginning in the late 1830s, as I've talked a little bit about, emerges as a fundamental source to interrogate in the wake of communal land enclosures in the late 1840s and subsequent territorial dispossession later on in the 19th and 20th centuries. And I write about that kind of territorial dispossession in my second chapter of this book, where I write about uh, Supreme Court of the Territory of Hawaii's cases dealing with the evaluation of hoa'aina that have royal patents and land commission awards, which were tested under British common law notions of property. And then those hoa'aina, like my tutu wahine, ko'olau, were ejected from their aina because their royal patents and land commission awards didn't match British common law standards. So that's the kind of territorial dispossession I'm talking about in the 19th and 20th century. And so this also meant alienation from not just ancestral land, but also the ecological practices in and with them, like cultivating makaloa and ulana for makaloa mats themselves. The standardization of money as a medium of exchange to measure the value of materials like makaloa and commodities like makaloa mats to produce exchange value is this process that Karl Marx labeled transubstantiation. Consider the same 1841 tax law that's shown here on this slide. The government created policy if citizens couldn't pay taxes and money to establish monetary equivalents for kukui nuts, arrowroot, and pigs at least a fathom or six feet long, among other things. Half a barrel of kukui became equivalent to a dollar, whereas six barrels and two-thirds represented the value of one fathom swine. That's pretty cheap, huh? <laughs> arrowroot became equivalent to three cents per pound, and 333 pounds were equal to one fathom swine. This process, this process of transubstantiation, though, didn't just impress labor alienation in Hawaii, but also Kanaka Maoli replacement, dispossession, and elimination, as I explain next. This is actually a tax assessor's receipt from 1864. You can see the different kinds of taxes that are labeled here, and they're associated equivalent in dollar amount that needs to be paid, right? Luna Ao Hao were going around Hawaii and offering these receipts to Kanaka. Um, and so if you didn't have the dala, if you didn't have the kala, then there were monetary equivalents that were created that you could exchange instead. The institution of taxes to be paid in cash, Noi Noi Silver writes, quote, caused people to be alienated from their ancestral lands, which undoubtedly contributed to the weakening of their bodies, not to mention their spirits. Makaloa mats had traditionally been offered as ho'okupu, but after an 1850 penal law abolished makaloa mats as ho'okupu, this exchange for tax payment when a makaloa became devalued in at least three really important ways. First, the mats were laborious to produce, 
taking years to complete, and held low financial return due to the prolonged labor time for production that exceeded what was socially necessary in a market. Second, weavers were forced to compete in a global market at that time for similar mats traded from other countries, producing them quicker and cheaper. Third, cultivating, gathering, and processing makaloa became challenging because of settler agricultural development or what Marx refers to as the rise of capitalist farmers and colonies. In 1864, Ni'ihau, where makalo was primarily grown and harvested in just 13 marshy swamp bogs across the island, was purchased, like I mentioned previously, by the Sinclair Gay Robinson family, the same family of which George S. Gay acquired and delivered the mat to Kalakaua, like I opened this talk with. The family drained ponds where Mokaloa grew to develop pastures for raising cows, raising goats, raising sheep, which were invasive to Hawaii, but more fungible, more profitable than Mokaloa. Even though the invasive livestock industry devastated Mokaloa, Kala'i opposed taxing these animals. Why? The issue for her was capital and its valuation of animals through the devaluation of makalo and its consequent damage to Aina and Kanaka relations with it. So in this context, Haole ethnologists and anthropologists have suggested that makalo, the knowledge and practice to make makalo mats and the master wahine weavers from Ni'ihau have all disappeared. But this simply wasn't the case. Kla'i refused the imposition of capital, and with that refused to disappear herself, nor let Mwena Ni'ihau vanish. Kla'i articulated her refusal, ironically, through the medium of a woven mat, which traditionally was offered as ho'okupu, prior to the standardization of money as a form of tax payment. In this sense, Aloha Aina was not presented metaphorically by Kala'i. It was grown in swamps. It was processed by many hands. It was woven with worn fingers and a gift to the sovereign. This Aloha Aina is ecological, nationalist, and native all at the same time. A materialist orient orientation against both capitalism and settler colonialism in Hawaii. This torch has been passed along to us, Marcus Hanale Marzan writes, quote, Do we deprive the voices yet unheard of this gift? Who among you will don this ancestral memory? End quote. In the spirit of the call by Marzan, a colleague of mine at Bishop Museum and Hoa of Pakuialua, my research is an attempt to reclaim and reinterpret this powerful gift and perpetuate its ancestral teachings preserve their memory, and act on the collective responsibility issued by them. E ho'ololi ikavai vai kolonaya. I want to return to the final passage in Kala'i's map to wrap up. I'm wrapping up here. Which exhibits an uh, entanglement in Hawaii unique to the formation of what I refer to as settler colonial capitalism, the way that this system is interlocking. The entanglement demonstrates a historically grounded yet future-oriented approach to aloha aina. That is, aloha aina is an ecological way of being that structures our uniquely Kanaka Maoli practice to refuse imperialist performances of state sovereignty. Kala'i ends her message here. And as you can see from this photo on the slide, the end of the message is in the top right corner. Right. I want to return to this. E kalani e, e ho'oku ua e yamako ina hana kanavai, kanoho kawa kua pa'ana malalo na haku o kalava, na u na kala. Kala is plated into the end of the conclusion. In the Hawaii State Archives, I haven't found Kala'i's name, Kala'i o Kamalino. I found it under Kala. I also find it ironic and playful, 
given what I've been talking about with the kauna here, um, that she would also end her message that criticizes money and monetary taxes with kala. This mat was intended to be given to the former mo'i, not kala kawa, intended to be given to William Luna Lilo, who died abruptly, ruling only from 1873 to 1874, so the mat was delivered to Kalakawa. This particular passage here is directed to Luna Lilo in deference for his royal genealogy connecting him to the divine cosmos. She asks Luna Lilo here to release the Lahui from the burdensome law that keeps Kanaka bonded as slaves Malalo and Ahaku Kaleva. Mary Kovena Pukui and Kiela Kana Gooch translated this as under masters from the sky. Taking a cue from their framing, Haole ethnologist Roger Rose, who published the only study about this mat in 1990, claimed Kala'i protested against the authority, the governance, and the sovereignty of oppressive rulers implementing savage taxes. His study naturalized the adoption of capitalism as inevitable to solve this Hawaiian problem, that is, Hawaiian despotism, savage taxation, which Rose effectively then absolves capital and its relations from transmitting forms of colonial power and the encroaching problem of settler colonialism. Rose's research and the work of predecessors like William Richards manufactures this romantic anti-capitalism that associated our elite with the negative dimensions of capital because of their burdensome pre-capitalist taxation, standardization of hard currency and money exchange, and oppressive monetary tax collection. If Richards constructed an idea about savage taxation in the Hawaiian kingdom in the mid-19th century, then Rose and his contemporaries fueled the idea at the end of the 20th century. One of my favorite quotations from the late great Hananike Trask I've extended here to describe both Richards and Rose. Anthropologists were very much like missionaries. One group colonized the spirit, whereas the other group colonized the mind. Naming it the protest map, Roger Rose contends it protested ali'i for their taxation policy, rather than as my hope, as my work hopes to show, how Kala'i's map and the message identified and criticized the ways in which capital greased the wheels of colonialism in Hawaii. The passage Malalo na Haku o Kaleva can also mean lords of the heaven, under lords of the heaven above, as in the lords of Protestant missionaries like Richards and numerous others sent to the islands to enlighten. These were American missionaries who also advocated for monetary taxes in petitions on animal ownership increasing them throughout the second half of the 19th century to civilize what they viewed to be a primitive people and to modernize the pre-modern non-market-based economy around gifts that they saw. Although Ali'i were associated with this negative dimension of capital in a developing colonial situation, Kanaka, like Kala'i, still posited opposition to imperialism and empire and affected important change as makainana, as hoa aina, to balance relations between kanaka and aina. Her criticism was not just a negative protest to overturn harm and imbalance in Hawaiian society, but a call for positive change and transformation to ho'olu lahui, to increase the people and grow the nation. Four years after receiving Kala'i's Muena Pavehe Makana in 1878, Kala'akawa, who received this Makana, eliminated all animal taxes as a main category in the tax code, except for one, on dogs. Still, the economic transformation during the 19th century, championed by Ali'i and sovereign Hawai'i from Kaui Keoli to Kala'akawa, inflected an imperial project taking place globally in the evolution of the Hawaiian state and modernization of Hawaiian society. By now, you may be asking yourselves, but Kala'i didn't name capitalism, colonialism, or imperialism in her protest. You're right. 
How many times have your kupuna said one thing and meant another? The kauna woven into the muena pavehe makana comes into clearer focus in one final mo'olalo. One final mo'olalo. According to an article in Kanupepa Ku'o Ko'a, after receiving the muena pavehe makana, Kalakawa ordered Kala'i to make two additional muena. Apparently, he was quite a fan. The mats he commissioned were for the U.S. Centennial Exposition in 1876. Kalakawa's request was for a lua mau muena me ke ki'i ho ailona o amelika a pelano ho i ko pelekania. Or two mats with the symbol of America and the other with that of Britain. Kalai's response, she refused. Kalai defied a decree from the king. She refused to obey his order. Moina requested for the celebration of two different empires, Britain and the United States, were never made. Encrusted in her sustained refusals of capital, settler colonialism, and imperialism, there is fresh, fierce insight about American thought in Hawaiian political economy and Kanaka Maoli ideas and practices of Aloha Aina, combining the ecological, the nationalist, and the native. These insights aren't locked away in our past, but living, breathing, and rising in our present for a future beyond the allure of imperialism, beyond <coughs> ongoing structural genocide, beyond enslavement to capital and its planetary destruction. It's indeed a future Kalai already lived. It's a future hopefully we all can live. Mahalo nui. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, the mo'olelo is spread out diffusely, honestly. In, and this is part of why it's been so important to me to piece it together. Um, so the mo'olelo is located in um, multiple nupepa, especially the ones that I showed in 1874. I haven't found others that specifically explicate the gifting of the Moena from Gay to Kalakaua, um, nor have I found other new Pepa around that time that talk about Kalai. So I've had to do a lot of research in the archives and um, learning about her family, uh, Nehu family. So uh, Kalamo Kaina Nehu is related to Kalai. Um, they have a Kalai in uh, this generation. So she's named after Kalai Okamalino, their kupuna. Um, so talking story with them, um, has been something that I've been trying to do uh, more. Um, but I've had my head in the archives, uh, quite honestly, for the past couple of years. And so, other than New Peppa, um, there isn't a lot. And where there is a lot is in what she gave us, right? What she gave Kalakaua. This wasn't just for Kalakaua. Um, you know, Kalakaua had it on display for many years. And as the map was transferred to the Bishop Museum eventually, um, later in the 20th century, it was kept in the Department of Cultural Collections archive um, a lot. So I began research in 2011, 2010 on the map, and actually it was still housed in downstairs in the Cultural Collections uh, Department archive. And it's funny because at the time, um, I would go to work at Bishop Museum to go up to cultural collections, and I had passed the exhibit on display, which was about economic transformation in the Hawaiian Islands. And I would go to people like Marcus uh, Hanale Marzan and Kamalu Dupriz, who's my brother's wahine, um, and others at Bishop Museum, and say, why isn't the mat on display? It tells a history. It tells a story. It gives an account from 
Wahine Ulana, from Makainana, from um, Samon Kupa, from Niihau, of economic transformation. So I've kind of been obsessed, if you will, with decoding the history that she presents in the actual text, the request itself, which led me to all the monetary um, policy in the Hawaii State Archives, which are very fascinating, also the tax laws. You know, so at this time, in the 1840s and 1850s and 1860s, um, Luna Aohao, the tax assessors, and the um, head of the Department of Finance were trying to figure out how to implement and enforce tax laws. So they passed each other messages. You know, sometimes um, teachers, for instance, would complain. Be like, hey, why we got to pay taxes? We're teaching. You know, wh how much tax do we have to pay? And the Luna Aohao would take that message and that petition sometimes to the head of the Department of Finance. And then they would together, intersubjectively, work out what it meant to tax Makainana, to tax Kumu. Um, you know, there's petitions and notes about those who are elderly, those who are unwilling to, to hana, right, to even work for a wage or work to produce something that could be exchanged. So Lunao Hao and the Department of Finance talked extensively about what to do. You know, this was a time period where written law was coming top down in some ways, like Noila Arista wrote. So it's super important for me to pay attention to the stories from below, right? Not even just the stories from below of like Hoa Aina or Makainana, but literally the stories that are written in Makaloa Sedge, right? Take care of Aina and Kanaka by taking care of, or, or through Aina, with Kanaka, right? So the story of Kala'i is spread out, but I did write a magazine article in like 2011 about it. Um, there are things in that magazine article, which is the Bishop Museum Kailele article um, in their magazine journal that, that I've spent 10 years learning more about. So even that magazine article, I don't uh, go back to <laughs> as much because there's so much else I've found. Yeah, so this, this is going to be published um, hopefully in the next two years as a part of my book project, Namakana uh, Ea. And um, uh, there's two presses that I'm currently working with. And I'm going to be working with the Bishop Museum um, also to specifically archive this chapter as a part of their texts that talk about the Mo'olalo of objects. We don't have a lot of mo'olelo of objects, like specific objects. So this was something for doing material culture research, which was really important for me. But the story is so much bigger than the moena, than kala'i. And that's what I'm trying to tell in this um, research. Yeah, I'll leave you here.